Welcome back to my car shop. Today we're going to be doing the finish work on this fender for John 66 Belvedere. Let's watch the show intro and we'll see you in 30 seconds. Don't go away. You're going to like this. Working out of a 100 year old refurbished barn. Bringing 35 years of experience to projects considered beyond repair. Vision, creativity, and problem solving are essential tools in this place. Watch as we transform junk into polished metal miracles. This is My Cars Shop. Well, that wasn't so bad, was it? So, it's been a while since I've worked on this Fender for John 66 Belvedere, and I know he's been working on the car. He's got the quarter panel at least partially welded on, and the engine's in the car, and he's really moving forward on it. The goal is to have this car on the road this spring, so I'm sure there'll be more coming on this soon. Uh, but on the last episode on this, which was episode 2 or episode 3, I had welded in all the patches, and I haven't done any of the mud work on this yet, so I wanted to share some of that with you and show how I do the fiberglass and Bondo work. And uh, it is a beautiful balmy day here in Michigan for uh, March. It is uh, it's about 60 degrees. It's supposed to reach a high of 65 today. A little bit windy, but it's a great day to spray primer, which means that the shiny car, the 47 Ford, needs to go out, which means the 74 Swinger also needs to go out. And that's also gonna be a good opportunity for me to uh, do a little cleaning in here. So. Uh, couple of things we're going to accomplish today. Uh, normally on, on this day of the week I do shop cleanup and getting ready for uh, the next episode filming in the next couple of days um, but the weather is supposed to be at its pinnacle right now so today's the day to get this done. I can clean when the weather turns to crap again. Um, so anyway what we need to be able to do is uh, going to DA this thing down, uh, go in and spread some tiger hair on the spots that I've welded the patches on and uh, I think I'm missing one up here somewhere. But anyway, uh, get this thing close to being roughed in, pull a couple of little dents here and there. I'll share that metal finishing process with you, and then we will um, spray some polyester primer on it after we put some edge primer on it. So that's where I'm hoping to go today. Not sure we'll make all of that. That's a lot of work to do, but that's where I'd like to end up on this particular piece before the, this episode's over. If we don't, then uh, you'll know that in a half hour, 40 minutes, I suppose. So let's just get after it. Got some room made in the shop here now and I can start looking things over. Uh, this is pretty good here so all I need to do here is just get a coat of tiger hair over this. A little cleanup to do with the DA along in here. Um, pretty good here. A little bit of work to do on the top there, not bad. There is some pinholes right in here so I'm probably just going to try to fill those. Um, yeah, the metal's pretty good there. And then uh, a little bit of rust here, I need to just take the grinder. So I think where I'm going to start is, um, since I'm going to have to mix up glass to do these spots, I'll probably try to mix up the glass to do both spots at once. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get this ground down here, get this little bit of rust out of here, get this metal clean, and we're going to work on filling those in real quick. And then uh, we'll glass both of these parts up once I get this one cleaned as well. Then we'll start looking everything else over and see what else has to be done. A couple little dents and stuff will pop out up here. I'll show you how to do that. Overall, this thing's in pretty good shape. Very small dent here. I don't know if I can get at the back side of that. No, I can't. Uh, we'll make a determination how we're going to handle that one. I may just fill that. It feels like it's about a sixteenth of an inch. So by the time I put just a little bit of glass in there and then fill it over with the uh, um, polyester primer. It'll probably level out nice and there won't be any, really very much mud in there at all. Uh, the, the thing that would be the ideal is to have one of those uh, weld-on stud things where you can slam, a, slam that out a little bit. I don't have one 
um, but there's another way I may be able to do that by just welding a uh, nail or a screw on there and just pulling up on that a little bit. I've done that before, so we may try that technique uh, and see if that works. As a matter of fact, that might be the best way to do that one right there. So we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, again, a couple of dents here. Uh, those I think I can just hammer and dolly out from the back side, so we'll be all right there. A little bit of a high spot here. Um, that again, we, I think we can hammer and dolly that. So it looks like we're going to spend a little more time hammering, hammering and dollying today uh, than I first thought, but that's fine. That's all part of finish work. But I still am on track so far to be able to get this. Um, I think we'll get this in the polyester primer today. And then once that's done, we can take it back to John. He can put it on the car. And we've got some painting and other things to do on other parts of the car. So we'll do the rest of the finish work after that. So I spent a fair bit of time going over that and roughing that up good, and uh, it feels pretty good. I'm going to put some rust conditioner on a few of these spots here, but overall things look good. I don't think we're going to have any issues, so we just got to fill these little holes here. If we don't fill those with weld, um, it, it's just going to bubble again because it'll get moisture through from the other side. So that's what needs to happen there. We'll uh, decide if we're going to, well there's a bunch of them. Hoping we don't have to put a patch in there, but we'll see. We'll uh, we'll see what we got here. Oh, I wanted to say also, it seemed like I was doing a lot of grinding in that time lapse, but I was I was putting zero pressure against that. I was just being very gentle and just trying to get as much of that rust out of there I could and get this metal cleaned up. Uh, Got to go over it with the DA yet, but uh, again, just very light pressure. Uh, to no pressure at all and just letting the grinder itself do the job. If you start hogging down, you're going to thin that material out and weaken that metal. I decided to just go ahead and take the cutoff wheel and just cut a slit here. That's where all that rust is anyway. Rather than trying to fill those little pinholes, I'll be able to just tag a bunch of uh, spot welds in there, fill that all up solid and grind that down and it should look good. So uh, there was, yeah, about two inches of just little pinhole rust. Everything else around it is solid. It's just weird, but it's like something was caught behind the uh, factory sound deadener. I'm also gonna probably use my piece of brass behind here uh, or my piece of aluminum, one of the two, so that I can do that without um, getting too much heat and without getting all kinds of blob on the back. So it'll fill nicely and uh, the aluminum or the brass, I think it'll be the aluminum, will uh, be a good heat sink to help keep that metal cool so it doesn't warp. So I've got my big pair, square piece of aluminum here. And uh, yeah, that's gonna fit nicely right there. Um, I think I'm gonna bring it up this way more. If I can't, I can't. So yeah, it needs to be a bit right there so that it's flush to the metal and then we'll get the welding clamps behind there. I know I shared this technique with you on the Challenger on the floor pans, uh, but I thought I'd go ahead and share it again. There we go, that pulled nicely. I'm gonna have to be a little bit careful because it did kind of pull that a little bit, but I think when I weld it and then take the pressure off, it'll come back. If not, I can dolly it out a little bit. Uh, but I think I'd rather do that and help control some of the way that metal moves. Yeah, it's not bad, it's not bad. It just pulled it just a teeny bit. In the time lapse, you noticed me coming in and touching. So your rule of thumb when you're doing sheet metal welding is if you can't put your hand against it, then you're gonna warp it, it's too hot. So you go and you do a few tacks, you check it until you can basically touch it, you go into a few more and you do some tacks until you can touch it and you do that over and over again until it's filled. So my aluminum helped with that. Uh, obviously I can touch it now so I can go back and do a little more. Um, but my clamp was definitely pulling this, so I want to dolly this just a little bit because it does tend to dip in just a little teeny bit right here. And before I get too much further, I just want to bring this back out just a little bit. It doesn't going to take much. 
uh, but we'll get that done right now. So I'm just going to put a flat dolly behind it and use it this way. Uh, it would be better if I had one that had a little curve, but I don't have one like that. So this will work. Just be gentle. The a little heavy on the nose. So right now I'm doing a little off dolly, which means the dolly is over here, but I'm kind of tapping in here. So my goal with that is to push this metal down here a little bit and then pull that up in here a little bit. So now I'm, now I'm pushing over in here with the dolly and just tapping over here to try to bring this up just a little bit. Very good. Okay, so again, I'll reiterate, I was doing off dolly first, um, which means that off dolly means that you're not pounding against the dolly with the hammer. Um, off dolly means that I've got the dolly here and I'm pounding around down over in here while I'm pushing. So what I'm trying to do is move this metal up and this metal down to get those to level out. Then I was doing off dolly the other way as well. I don't really want to pound and dolly on these because they're MIG welds. MIG welds are hard and you'll crack them. If it was a TIG weld, I could hammer on that. Now, why am I not using the TIG there? The reason is because a TIG welder really is pretty much useless on anything wider than a 16th of an inch gap. Um, it's, it's just not built to fill holes like that as easily. I'm not saying it can't be done, but in general, you're much better using a MIG where you've got a cut like this. So now I, this is very cool, it's in position, and I know the heat, when I start welding on this a little bit, it's gonna still move around, but I wanna try to fill the rest of these little spots in here, and then we'll let it cool, and, get the, and then there'll be probably three more attempts like that to fill that in. All right, we've got that spotted in there pretty well now. I think I've got all the holes filled, so we'll have to grind that down next. And of course, we want to grind the weld itself more than the metal around it, so we've got to be careful. Um, one thing about this that I want to mention is also, um, because you're doing little bitty spots, it, you, you're not going to get a weld that looks like what somebody would say is a good weld. Um, I mean, if you went and laid a good bead in there, what, what's the problem going to be is you're going to warp the crap out of everything. And remember, we're dealing with metal here that is less than 20 gauge. This is probably about down to 24 gauge because of deterioration from being since 1966. So keep that in mind. The goal here is to fill things in and give yourself a good base so the rust is gone, the pinholes are filled, and then it gives you a good base to put your tighter hair over. Um, if we wanted to really make it pretty we would cut a patch make it you know fit it so it's perfect and then tig weld it in uh, butt weld it all around but it wasn't that bad in my opinion i want to try to save as much of the original metal as i can and just going through and doing this little spotting here once we get this ground down good uh, it's going to look very respectable and uh, we'll be able to fill that over and it's going to look really nice So you can see already, even though I've just started, I've got the ground, I've got it ground down pretty well. Uh, it's not going to be.
perfect, like you can't see that it was welded, but it's gonna be very flat and smooth. And uh, so uh, there's more to do, but I just wanted you to see what it would look like after I took and uh, went over it just a little bit with that 36 grit disc and took some of that weld down. So I'm gonna get another grinder in there now and go at it a little bit more aggressively just on the weld. Uh, but if you feel across that, it's very flat. Uh, so we're, we're definitely, definitely getting there. Uh, also, again, heat when you're grinding, that's hot to the touch. So I need to just wait so I don't start warping stuff way over in here. Uh, we could warp this out here if we get too much heat in here. So now you can see that I've gone in there and ground it down more. The next step now is I'll take a wire brush once that cools down and just clean that up a little more. And I'm gonna call that good. I do need to flip it over onto the back side. Little spot right there that just keeps looking like it's a... I think that's a thin spot right there. I'll have to check that closer. That spot bugs me right there. I can see that metal moving a little bit. I think I need to do something with that as well. Could be wrong, I'll get a pick tool and push against it and we'll see. But the rest of this is real good now. So this spot right there, it looks, it looks like it's split. Oh, it's a pinhole, okay. That's why you gotta check this stuff. Another one right there, so it's another weak spot in the metal down here, yep. A whole bunch of them, good thing I checked it. That would have been a problem. That probably would have caused the Bondo to crack. So in doubt, get yourself a nice pick and just give a shove in there. Now the rest of this, obviously, we're good. It's nice and solid. It's just a little unevenness in the weld. So we'll weld that up right now, get that done. You'll notice I was being a little bit more aggressive and not following my rule as much. I was really watching this metal out here and I'm very close to this edge so I knew I could be a little bit more aggressive um, in not having to wait quite as long. But you still have to be really careful that you don't warp that metal. Um, it's just experience that I knew that I could um, go a little faster there and get that filled in. But uh, if you're new at this, don't go at that as aggressively as I just did because that's almost 40 years of experience of welding sheet metal there that I knew I could get a little more aggressive and not warp it. Um, so just a word to the wise, do as I say, not as I do, right? <laughs> as you gain more experience, you'll know what you can get away with. 
Um, and the only way you're going to learn that is by warping the crap out of stuff. And I still do that once in a while. Um, so, you know, it's something that you, you've got to just play the game and gamble. But the uh, big thing about metal is if you mess it up, fix it. It's all said and done. The metal's nice and flat, um, so all the rust holes are now filled and fixed. Whoops! A little pinhole right there. I better take care of. But uh, that'll be just a quick. Bzzzt. Well, I've got two of them. There's one right there too. Two little pinholes. I might as well fill both of them. Or three. There's another one. That's the thing you'll find. Um, I don't have to get that crazy, I suppose. Tiger hair is going to fill that, but I just assume go ahead and just take the split second and do those up while I can. Yeah, there's another one right up there too. So I got five of them, I think. I'm going to mark them with a marker so I know where they're at. And of course, we uncovered a little thin spot down here that we had to go a little further with. But now we'll grind that up and I think we're going to be in good shape. Everything looks like it's filled now. Um, so on the back side, which I didn't show you, but I did flip it and grind it, there's a bunch of rust pits. So I've got that cleaned up on the other side, and I think that's why I found a couple of spots in here that were a bit thin yet, so I chased those out. And uh, metal is still not hot, so we're okay. And uh, a little bit warm, but not bad. And so we'll grind those down, and uh, I think we're ready to start doing a little bit of rust conditioning down here. And again, I got to do some wire brushing here. So let's get that ground up and then we'll go from there. And I think we're metal finished well enough there now that we can let that go. And uh, so I'm going to put a little rust conditioner down here only on that rusty spot. And then I think we're ready to spread some tiger hair over the back and the front. Which means I forgot to clean this up again. So I need to run over here real quick and use my wire brush and my roll lock and just dress that up uh, just a little bit in there. So it's, it's pretty much ready, but I just want to polish it up just a little bit. And it looks like I've got just a touch of a high spot right there. So I'll tap that down just a little bit as well. If you haven't guessed by now, finish work takes a long time. Um, it's not nearly as rewarding, in my opinion, as the fabricating part, um, but it's essential if uh, you're going to go further. Uh, when I set out in life, I, I never intended to, you know, to do finish work. I never intended to paint. Uh, I had the opportunity when I was in college. I worked in a hot rod shop, and uh, a friend of mine that was the body guy at the time started teaching me some things, and we kind of swap back and forth. I taught him some things about building engines and mechanical. He taught me some things about paint and body. And so uh, over the years I've developed the skills to paint a pretty respectable car. And uh, so that's kind of what we're moving into next. Although we're not going to be doing the finish work on this fender right away. Uh, when we're done with this thing, it's going to look pretty decent. And uh, that's what we're shooting for. So I need to do a little bit more hammer and dolly work. And then I think we can start spreading a little bit of fiberglass, tiger hair, and uh, a little bit of Bondo, and uh, we shouldn't be far away from being able to put some uh, polyester primer on this thing, and that's where we're going to stop on the finish part of this until we get the rest of the car further along. So again, I need to work on uh, these dents here. So I'll use my, uh, my block, put it in behind there as best as I can to try to hold that material and then tap down here. I'm not sure what I'm going to do here yet. Uh, but we'll worry that this one, get this one looking decent, and then we'll move over there.
when it comes to doing body work, you've got to think outside the box a little bit. So it would be nice if I had a hammer that had a little bit of a wedge that I could have just got in here and tapped that out, but I didn't have one. So what I ended up doing was taking my vice grips and just bringing this lip up and getting it out of my way a little bit. And uh, I've got things pretty well straightened out now, but I took my uh, small vice grip welding clamp, and just pinched the weld as hard as I could and just tapped it and then slid it along and t loosened it up. Came back up here again, tap, 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 slid it down along across that vent, tightened it up a little bit more, and I got about 80% of it out of there like that, uh, to the point that I feel it's good enough and I'm comfortable with it. So I just need to bend this lip back down just a little bit more here, and uh, we'll be able to just go over on the other side, metal finish that a little bit, and be ready to uh, put just the thinnest little hair of tiger hair in there, and we'll be good to go. Okay, so here was the first dent that we worked out. There's just a little dimple right there that I'm not going to worry about. It's not worth trying to get out. Um, it's not very high, so I think we're good. Uh, I think it's going to level up. I think just actually the primer is going to level that out. Little teeny divot here now where that big dent was, and everything is gone here now that I've metal finished it. Uh, went around it with the grinder a little bit, put some heat into it, and it actually popped it out a little bit more. So I uh, don't want to do much of that. But this here is... I mean, this is less than a sixteenth of an inch, probably a thirty-second of an inch. So again, that would easily fill with, with Bondo or uh, with polyester primer. Um, so this is the tedious work that is body work. There's obviously a lot more to do to this fender yet before we can put it in primer. And uh, quite frankly, I'm going to have John, the owner of this car, uh, spend some time with his wire wheel on the back side and do all the finish rust work. That's not the visible stuff that needs to look pretty, but. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's stuff that, you know, anybody can do and my expertise is better spent in other areas. We still have to pull this dent up here yet. Uh, we'll get that done here yet. I'll show you a little trick for that one too. So I want to go ahead and mix up some tiger hair and go ahead and get this stuff seamed in and then we can start with the Bondo. Um, but I think we're really close here, so... Um, we'll get that done and then while that's drying, we'll start working on this dent that's up here that I was just mentioning and getting that pulled out. There's a slight crease on the top. The more I look at that, it's so minor, I think I'm going to let that go and just go ahead and put a slight skin coat of that tiger hair over that. I've got to do a little more cleanup work, but I'm afraid that I'm going to make a bigger problem uh, if I try to fix it and we don't want to do that. Um, Got a little hammer and dolly work to do right in the very front of it and that's going to pop some of it out if i did have the stud type of uh, thing to weld the studs in there and then have the puller to pull on those i could pull that out a little bit but with any of the equipment that i have uh, my instincts tell me don't push it you'll just make it worse uh, so yeah we're, we're getting close there's a little teeny dent right there as well i don't think i can get at that one either no i can't so uh Probably not going to mess with that one, but this one I've definitely got to. It's like a quarter of an inch. So I'm getting ready to uh, mix up some tiger hair, and I thought I should mention something. It's not a good idea to use cardboard to mix up Bondo. However, what I did with this one earlier was I just took and put a little teeny bit of tiger hair on it to seal it, and so I'm not worried about it sucking up um, solvents out of the tiger hair or the, the uh, hardener. And that's the reason you really shouldn't use um, your cardboard for that because it will suck stuff up and screw up the mixture and the solvents won't come out right. But once I've got a little skim coat on there, I know it's not going to. And the more I use it, the more I'll just keep using it and sanding it out. And pretty soon I will have a board that is just full of a nice layer of filler that I can use to continue as my mixing board. That's what I do. Some guys go out and buy the plastic things uh, for mixing it or whatever, but don't use just raw cardboard without sealing it like that. Otherwise, you, I suppose you could spray it with like clear coat or something too, but um, just plan ahead a little bit. Like I said, I took a little bit of tiger hair. I didn't even smooth it out. Uh, that'll come in time, but I just 
put it on there a little bit real quick, kind of wiped it over a little bit and good enough. I know that's not going to absorb the uh, solvents out of my Tiger Hair, my Bondo or my hardener. Another thing that is worth talking about is how to mix Bondo, which sounds weird, but there's a trick to it. Don't mix up more than you need. First of all, it's better to do small batches. And again, this is tiger hair, uh, but it's better to do small batches of the stuff than to do too much all at once, uh, because first of all, you're not gonna get it mixed well. That's probably enough for those two spots that I wanna do. Um, yeah, that looks good. First of all, with your hardener, make sure that you knead it real well. Especially if it's been sitting around for a while, it'll be watery. So take that tube, squish it around, especially down at the bottom, squeeze that up. Get it moving around in that tube. I like to uh, squeeze some of the air out if I can. Whoops, too much. Squeeze some of the air out of there if I can so that I can actually move the product around inside the tube. Um, again, I'm doing this uh, simply explaining things. If you already know this, I apologize for redundancy or whatever, but a lot of people don't know any of this stuff, and so you know that's why a lot of people are here, and I want to be sure to share everything. Okay, so once the solvents and the liquids and so forth are kneaded around pretty good, um, you can squeeze some out. Now, for about that much, um, that's probably about as much hardener as I'm going to use. That may be a little bit excessive, um, but that's, that's what I'm going to use there. It's probably not too excessive. The next thing is you don't want to stir this. So what you want to do is, is work it in. So I'm working it over, coming over, cutting into it. So you see that that hardener now is down here on the cardboard and it's not soaking into the cardboard because I got that layer of tiger hair already on there. So you're gonna work it back and forth. Spread it across, flatten it out, work it sideways. You do, Like I said, you don't wanna work it don't want to stir it. You want to just keep using the edge, cutting it in, coming back, cutting it in, flattening it out, coming at it from different angles until you've got a good consistent mixture and you know that that hardener is mixed in well into your tiger hair or your bondo. It's the same principle or even with spot putty if you're using glaze or spot putty that uses a, a hardener. Um, it's all the same principle. You don't want to be stirring it. The one thing that you're mixing air bubbles into your Bondo, and you don't want to do that. All right, I feel pretty good about that now. I think we're good. Spread that out one more time. Yep, we're good. Okay, so we can go over and put this on the fender now. So we'll start here, and I'm just going to spread it across. There's a million different opinions on how this should be done. I'm just gonna do it the way I do it. So I like to come across it this way first. Just kind of fill it in. And don't let anybody tell you there's anything wrong with Bondo. What's wrong is when body work isn't done properly and Bondo is used to compensate and you end up with too much Bondo. Uh, there's not a show car out there I don't say not any, but very few show cars out there or custom cars that don't have mud in them. So often what people say, oh, look at the waves in that car, that's a Bondo bucket. Actually, it's probably not a Bondo bucket. It probably means that it wasn't finished properly and that's why it's wavy. Bondo done properly won't be wavy. Again, I'm, not, I'm just roughing it in right now. This is a base layer. I'm doing this for strength. Uh, to fill in things so that it doesn't crack when I go over it with regular Bondo. Uh, generally, I'll only do one coat of this, uh, so maybe two, depending, but I think this is turning out pretty well. Get this up here a little bit. Um, the goal is obviously to get it as smooth as possible so that you don't have to do a whole bunch of sanding. It's kind of a slippery, slimy thing, that's for sure. But this all is for um, sealing and strength and as a good base layer because Bondo will crack tiger hair. I won't say it won't crack, but it's less likely to crack. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's go on the backside now. I've got enough for that. 
And again, all I gotta do is this right here. If I have any extra, I'll go up and do a little bit on that uh, spot on the wheel well where that small dent is that we need to fill in a little bit. And I should have a little extra. It actually looks pretty good. That's actually pretty good. Okay, let's go up here now. Again, I mixed minimal amounts of hardener so that it doesn't harden fast. And the reason for that is because if it does harden too fast, it's more brittle. So the slower it dries, the more flexible it's gonna be, the less it's gonna crack over the long run. So a good slow dry is better than a fast dry when it comes to this stuff. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and just kind of scrape off both sides of my spreader. And I'm going to, uh, just to minimize that. And then I'm gonna scrape along this just like that. And what I'm actually doing is laying out another layer of that fiberglass. Just a teeny hair. I may go over that with a DA sander. And now because a lot of times I'll leave a big goober of Bondo if I have extra here. I don't. So I'm going to go ahead and wipe this down with a rag, which I wouldn't do if I had more because it cleans easier if you leave a ball and then just crack it off when it's dry. But uh, I don't have that here because I'm still trying to build up my palette. So I'm just going to wipe this off real quick. And if I wanted to be real anal about it, I would get some mineral spirits or some prep salt or some lacquer thinner or something, but this is good enough. Okay. First of all, I can hear some of you saying that I forgot to put tiger hair on the spot where I did that slit weld to get those thin spots and those pinholes out. I hear you, and you're absolutely right. I forgot. Um, we'll get it next time. No big deal. I'll mix up just a little bit. I'll probably have to have some for this. So what I want to do is, first of all, clean this out here as best as I can, probably just with the wire wheel. And uh, then I'm going to, well, you'll just see what I'm going to do. Let's just not spoil the surprise. This is a little technique that uh, I came up with. I don't know if anybody else has ever done it, but uh, it, it works to pull small dents out. I actually used this on the 7 Ford. Yeah, good. Pulling it up already, that's good. of wood but I don't have one it's coming up nicely I wish I had a little thinner piece of wood but I don't let's try it this way this might work obviously you got to be careful you don't dent your material there we 
we go. Voila, dent is pretty much out. I'll bring you over here and let you look. So now I just need to take my grinder and cut and grind the nail and the weld down. And there's just a very small little piece of dent right in there. And the nice thing about doing this is the heat from tagging that nail in there actually helps get that metal a little bit loosened up so that it, uh, in my opinion at least, makes it a little easier to pull. As I was pulling on it, all of a sudden I just felt it go whoop right into place. It was, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. I love it when that happens. Um, so yeah, just using a little old nail, cutting it off. I should have cut it a bit longer, um, but I didn't measure it, I just guessed. And if I'd had a little thinner piece of wood, it would have been better. But there's no dents up in here from that wood at all, and everything is good. So uh, good to go. there so uh, good to go so now we'll hit this uh, with a little bit of tiger hair here as well as back over there where I forgot before this is almost ready um, yeah it's pretty good so uh, we'll probably start getting that ready to, to take down the way it needs to be taken down I set the goal for myself today of getting this all roughed in, which I've done. Um, there's a lot more work to do to it yet. I didn't get this one dent dealt with up here, but I really, really want to hit the objective of getting this in primer. Um, and I'm ready for that. I can come back and touch this dent up later. Everything else is pretty well ready to go. Uh, it's rough, but we're going to hit this with just a light dusting of etching prime. Uh, after we wipe it down with some prep saw, I got a few rusty spots dealt with rust conditioner and uh, we'll hit a few spots with etching prime like I said and then once that's dry we're going to go back and we're going to flood this with um, some polyester primer um, and that'll be, that'll be a big step forward. Uh, polyester primer is really pretty much just a spray bondo and so while a lot of guys might like to go through and do the tiger hair and then put Bondo over the top of that. With the polyester primer, it is a Bondo type product, so you can just Bondo right over it. So I would rather get this whole thing covered up and then go back and touch up the spots that need to be dealt with that way. Like I said, I do need to deal with this dent up here, but I'm running out of time today and I really want to hit my goal. Uh, so it's no big deal to go back and grind out a little spot, fix this dent, and then uh, put some more primer over it. Because with polyester, that's the primer that I'm gonna be blocking anyway. So I'm gonna block that a lot to get this roughed in and get this thing pretty flat. So that's a big step. Uh, so let's get that wiped down. We'll hit it with some etch prime and uh, then we'll shoot some polyester on it and that'll be a good step forward for this product project for today.
So with etching prime, you don't have to do it on heavy. You just cover it all with a light dusting. Any uh, oxidization that is on there, uh, that's going to convert that, and then it bites into the metal so that the next layer of product, which in this case is going to be polyester, <coughs> excuse me, and I was wearing a respirator, um, so that any uh, the next layer of product it has something really good to bite into. So this uh, the humidity is a little bit walked today, so. Uh, going to take a little bit to dry, but by the time I get the paint gun out, get it cleaned up, and get the polyester mixed up, let it sit so that it, it has time to uh, flash and so forth, um, we'll be good to go. So. We have a couple of coats of the polyester on there. It needs to dry for an hour at least. Uh, it's going to be drying for longer than that, but it's already drying to the touch in some spots. I tend to get a little carried away with that stuff and flood it on pretty good. Um, so it takes a little longer to dry, but it's fine. Um, I know they say you're supposed to put lighter coats than that, but I've always just put it on with a fire hose as long as it's not running. It's fine to me. Uh, especially when it's over just etch prime like that. If it's over another product more like uh, paint or something like that, I uh, probably wouldn't put it on that heavy because I don't want it to cause something to lift, but there's nothing to lift under here except some tiger hair and a little bit of that light dusting of etching primer. So it's all good. Uh, it looks great. Uh, obviously it's rough. There's, uh, it's got to be blocked out about six billion times. Uh, but all I intend to do from this point forward is go through and patch up. Uh, there's, there's a few little spots up in here I can see from where we uh, welded in those trim holes from the Belvedere, that, uh, the, or from the satellite, the Belvedere didn't have those. We may need to do something with this. I don't know what the emblems are like on the Belvedere. Um, there's, uh, like I said, that dent up here I need to deal with. And then where I have the rough dent fiberglass, none of that's been mudded or sanded yet. So um, you can see the edges, that's all gonna disappear probably in the first coat of this stuff. Uh, the way I'll generally do this is I'll block it out, um, get things filled in, you know, uh, feathering out the edges and so forth. Uh, if I need to go back and touch up some fiberglass work, I'll do that. Uh, and then sand it out again, probably prime it again, block it out again, and then any Bondo work that needs to be done, and then hit it probably with one more coat of this. So all told with this product, uh, we've used maybe a quarter of a quart to a third of a quart, probably a quarter, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it goes a long ways, and uh, like I said, I was putting it on with a fire hose, so it's uh, yeah, it's getting tacky, but getting to the point that it's going to be dry to the touch. It's not the best drying day today either. I wish we had some hot sun. I could put it outside, but this is the day I was waiting for, um, 65 degrees out. So able to have the door open, have the other cars out. I've got the Oakland covered up, the Challenger, who cares? Uh, there's nothing else in here that's really going to get hurt. And this stuff doesn't do overspray like a base coat or a clear coat or even a regular primer. So um, it's just literally a spray bondo product. And uh, I love this stuff. Uh, I've been using it now for probably close to 10 years, uh, probably about the time it first came out. Maybe it was out longer, but when I first became aware of it, I started using it, and I just can't say enough good about it. It just saves a lot of time. You know, back in the day, uh, when we would do a show quality car, we would skim coat everything with Bondo. And uh, that's how you get those things perfectly flat and uh, saves you a lot of work in the primer, especially back in the day when you were doing lacquer primers that took forever to cure. Um, you skim, so, skim coat something down and then block it out so the, if there's any Bondo left at all, it's just paper thin, but it, it just saved a lot of time. Where, uh, where this now, you can spray this on there. 
uh, it kind of is a crossover between the skim coating with Bondo and all of the uh, flattening we used to do in lacquer primer. Uh, and it's way cheaper than the um, urethane primers and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me, I think this was, I'd had this quarter a while. Whew, solvents are strong. Uh, I've had this quarter a while. I think I paid 30 bucks for it, maybe. And uh, I know I used some on the 47 out of that quart, and there's still at least a half a quart left. So we're going to have plenty to finish this fender. Uh, like I said, it's looking good. I'm pleased with it. So, so as I said, in an hour or so, this will be dry to the touch. I got a lot of putting things away to do because I have to get the cars put back in here. It's supposed to rain uh, later this evening or tomorrow, but they never sit outside anyway, so that's kind of irrelevant. Um, so we'll get this stuff cleaned up, and this will be dry in a while, get the cars put away, etc., etc., and that'll be a day. So as I've said before, I really try to just share a day in the shop with you. So whether we accomplish something that we set out to do like we did with this, which was getting it glassed in, getting those last bits filled in, um, getting it tight, you know, glassed in, like I said, and then getting primer on it, which we did accomplish that. Um, or you know, we may have gotten snagged up on something and not gone any further uh, like we did on several projects here. I think the floor pan in the, in the Challenger was one of those uh, where I didn't accomplish as much as I wanted to and I, I shared with you what I got done. Um, and that's on purpose, you know, there's uh, about 350 of you here now. The channel just keeps growing and I am so appreciative of that. Um, but I really try to share the details of what it takes to do this kind of work. Um, we got to a point on the Challenger where I'm ready to start fabricating again and working on the frame rail on the drive, on the passenger side, and uh, I just need a break from it. Uh, I love that work, but there comes a point when you're just like, I just don't feel like tearing into that. Chances are before this week is out, I'll be working on an episode on that frame rail. Um, but right now I wanted to move forward on John's fender because I know he's working on the car and uh, it would be nice to get this over to him soon and get it set on the car. He can work on the back sides of it and so forth, uh, getting the wire brush down and uh, rust conditioning or whatever he wants to do on the back side of that, if anything. But it'll be a step forward. Uh, once he's done hanging the quarter panel and the weather breaks nice here, we're going to bring that 66, uh, 66 Belvedere over here and we're going to do some color matching and paint this fender and the quarter panel and blend that into the door and the hood and do the best we can because we're not going with a full-blown restoration on that car. Um, this year he wants to drive it, just have it look decent, and then at some point in the future he'll strip it down to the bare bones, strip the thing down to bare metal, and start over again with a good restoration on that car. Uh, but I don't blame him. He's got the car. He's got the excitement. Uh, he's not far from being able to drive it. He's got most of the parts. And if it was mine, this is exactly what I would be doing with it. In fact, I probably would just drive it with this in primer, and who cares for a summer? But it's his car. We'll do what he wants with it. So uh, that's good. That's a great thing done. I appreciate you being here. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Um, hit the bell for notifications, smash like on the videos when you watch them if you would. Um, I can tell when you guys are watching more and when you're liking things because we start getting new subscribers on the channel because there's activity on the channel. It pushes us up into the recommended videos for other people. Uh, so you guys are really the ones who are making this channel grow. Um, thanks to the guys at ebodies.org uh, for uh, joining us here. I know a lot of you are here and I appreciate that. Um, thanks to the guys from uh, Ready Mopar Muscle and Bad Tree Productions for also being here. I know a bunch of you are here from there. Uh, if you want to watch us or see us on Instagram and Facebook, it's forward slash my car shop. And uh, this primer's killing my throat, so I'm going to get out of here and let, the, let this air out. But I didn't forget. Rock. <laughs>